This is the story of the Dutch centre parties that burst onto the scene throughout the 1980s and the early 90s. They were the first significant far-right parties to thrust themselves onto Dutch politics in the post-war period, but their success was short-lived in the end, barely a momentary blip on the ballot paper. Why did they falter? This video will attempt to analyse their rise and fall. This is the first in a three-part series discussing the far-right and subsequent right-wing populist parties in the Netherlands. The Dutch far-right has never had a strong subculture to draw from. Prior to the Second World War, there were numerous fascist groupuscules that emerged, but always without significant influence. At its zenith, the Dutch National Socialist Party obtained just over 4.2% of the vote during the parliamentary elections of 1937 and boasted tens of thousands of members, but this was hardly earth-shattering. Come the Nazi occupation, the NSB became the only legal party in 1941, and thus obviously experienced a surge in membership and support. This was, however, short-lived. In 1944, the exiled Queen Wilhelmina signed the resolution concerning the dissolution of treasonable organisations, and with that the NSB was prescribed and 100,000 were interned. Any organisations attempting to resurrect Nazism in the Netherlands were to be banned also. This was the beginning of an incredibly repressive society for far-right organisations, and would come to characterise the experience of the centre parties, occasionally with devastating consequences. Some of those suffering under the initial state repression formed a support network known as the Foundation of Former Political Delinquents in 1951. This later evolved into a small political party, the National European Social Movement, that was swiftly outlawed. What followed throughout the subsequent 20 years was the familiar story of numerous irrelevant cadres of individuals forming short-lived groups before splintering into further peripherality. It wasn't until the formation of the Dutch People's Union in 1971 that the far-right was put back on the map. Interestingly, the party initially had strong ties with the Belgium Flams bloc, with prominent bloc member Roland Reyes taking the position of vice president. Both parties embraced the aim of uniting Flanders with the Netherlands. Flam's bloc were to experience much more success in their native country than the Dutch People's Union ever would, though. What brought the NVU to the nation's ire was the outspoken chauvinism of Joop Glimmerveen, who fronted the party from 1974. Glimmerveen tilted the party sharply to the right, basically transforming it into an out-and-out neo-Nazi organisation, much to the chagrin of some of the rank and file. He led a much maligned campaign in 1974 for The Hague in the municipal elections, under a platform strongly critical of immigration. The Hague must stay white and safe, away with the Surinamese and Antillianese who parasite on our energy and on our welfare. Help me free our city from the plague of the Surinamese and the Antillianese, he bellowed. Indeed, this rhetoric was held responsible for numerous conflicts between Dutch and immigrant communities about the period, which in turn peppered the NVU with an increased public profile. Thing is though, the NVU could never boast more than a few hundred members. Its platform and ideals served to alienate more than they could ever hope to ingratiate. Lo and behold, true to the Dutch post-war fashion, the party was prescribed in 1978. Should note this decision was repealed the next year, but by then the party was nothing but a moribund dead end. Our emphasis then is not on the NVU, but an offshoot. In 1980, a crowd of dissatisfied NVU members decided to form their own party. This wouldn't be a Nazi party though. In fact, it would go to great lengths to disassociate itself from the extremist quackery of Glimmerveen. The fruits of this effort was the Dutch Centre Party, its name itself a nod to the supposedly moderate nature of the novel outfit. Its leader was NVU veteran Henry Brookman. Brookman was a professor at the Free University of Amsterdam and surrounded himself with the more high-minded, intellectual and less jingoistic of the Netherlands' far-right community. The name and slogan, Not Right, Not Left, proved a futile attempt to dampen the party image as anything other than a slightly watered-down NVU ripoff. The preponderance of NVU veterans among the founders put paid to this illusion. So much so, in fact, that Brookman was under extreme pressure from his employer to pack it all in and leave the political theatre for good. Brookman paid heed and installed Hans Janmaat as de facto leader of the party, 
although Brookman hoped he would still have control. His hopes were in vain. The story of the Dutch far right is very much a story of Jan Mat. A tragic story if there ever was one, and it does seem that his prolonged involvement in politics stemmed from nothing more than his multiple failures and misfortunes, both within the political sphere and without. Indeed, by the time he may have had second thoughts, is the ostracism, the loneliness, the backbiting and the threat of violence all worth it? It was too late. For almost two decades, the Dutch far right was to become synonymous with Jan Mat, until his untimely death in 2002. Jan Mat was never a natural politician. His real passion was aeronautical engineering of all things, but not coming from a well-off family and having eight other siblings competing for resources, he had to cease his studies after only a year. After that, throughout the 1960s, he ran a furniture company with his brothers, but this too was to fall through after a fire ravaged the place in 1966. The insurance company payout went towards further education in political science, where he did remarkably well, and was spoken of highly by his peers. What followed was a period of political wandering. Always recalcitrant and never one to keep his mouth shut, Jan Mat moved from left to right, first cutting his political teeth in the Catholic People's Party, then joining the Social Democratic Democratic Socialists Party. Neither offered him a stable home. It wasn't until he read an article in the Free Netherlands magazine that he ventured into the Centre Party. He became their seventh member and soon to be leader of the party's parliamentary wing in 1982. Jan Mat brought to the Centre Party what other members couldn't. Respectability. He wasn't sullied by dirty far-right associations and thus was positioned well to make a good go of it. Their electoral campaign for the 1982 elections mostly focused on immigration, but also other issues like law and order, environmental protection, animal welfare, and social benefits. The result was only a paltry 0.8% of the votes, but sure enough, in the incredibly proportional system of Dutch politics, it was enough to secure one seat of 150. Two years later, the party garnered an unheard of 2.5% nationally in the European elections. Things were on the up for the Dutch far right, but of course, this was only to be a temporary phenomenon. Tensions between the more moderate parliamentary wing of the party, led by Jan Maat, and the old NVU guard of founders grew, and eventually resulted in Jan Maat being kicked to the curb. He took his parliamentary seat with him and sat for some time as an independent. Well and truly back in the hands of the extremists, the centre party was never again to win national representation. In 1986, they won a measly 0.4%. That same year, the party was done for electoral fraud. In order to gain enough signatures to stand, they'd told people they were signing in protest against rent increases. The fine levied ultimately bankrupted the party, and that was that. A hardcore National Socialist offshoot, the Centre Party 86, formed in its stead, although was never to be electorally significant by any standard, and was eventually declared a criminal organisation. Jan Mats wasn't anywhere near finished though. Precipitously, a few weeks prior to his split from the Centre Party, a new party had been founded, the Centre Democrats. The party platform was near identical to the Centre Party of old, only Jan Mat joined and quickly took complete control. Buoyed by already having a seat in Parliament, the party was to achieve more than the Centre Party ever would. Not without cost though. The political environment for both the Centre Party and the Centre Democrats was incredibly repressive. Jan Mat was virtually ignored in Parliament and complained of never being given due regard by his political peers, but this isn't where our attention should be focused. In what is quite possibly the single most disgusting event in modern Dutch political history, both the Centre Democrats and the Centre Party found themselves victims of a horrific firebombing attack in 1986. The two parties had met in a hotel in the small village of Kerichen, broaching the possibility of a merger when left-wing activists surrounded the hotel and burned it to the ground with party members inside. Party secretary and soon-to-be wife of Hans Janmat, Will Sherman, was left with no choice but to jump from a window. The result was an amputated leg. To this day, the case is still somewhat regularly discussed on Dutch television. Sherman herself, now widowed, regularly gives interviews but lives a life of destitution, alone, living mostly with the sole company of her pet birds. But hold on, the story is yet to get worse, 
We'll come to it later though. The period leading up to the 1989 elections was a surprisingly orderly affair on the part of the Centre Democrats. They put together a cogent campaign and even published their first party programme, albeit littered with grammatical errors. I should perhaps dedicate some time to what their actual policies were, as hitherto I've simply been labelling them as far right, when that would, in all honesty, be kind of misleading in some ways. In terms of racism, they undoubtedly had many unsavoury characters in their midst, but mostly it seems their conception of Dutchness was civic as opposed to racial. Great emphasis was paid to assimilation and repatriation for those that refused it. The party programme stated, foreigners and minorities either adjust to the Dutch ways and customs or leave the country. It railed against what was termed as anti-Dutch sentiment, endemic in the politics of the day, and vowed to dismantle state-sanctioned multiculturalism. The power of the state should be limited to allow for free enterprise, but also a hefty safety net should be installed and maintained. The party were able to field candidates in all 19 electoral districts, giving them state-subsidised TV and radio slots. Despite the measly membership of around 300, the party did well enough to return Hjanmash to Parliament after losing his seat in 1986. This was nothing though. 1994 was the year that properly put the Centre Democrats on the map. Mostly for all the wrong reasons though, and although they did better than any other far-right party prior, it was short-lived and lacklustre compared to what had been expected. Polling had suggested the party were to take in excess of 5%, although this didn't materialise. Mostly due to a hefty media campaign against the party and a strong stigma attached to any form of support. No short of three undercover journalists infiltrated the party in the run-up to the elections, offering lewd pieces of crude racism served up at closed-off party meetings. One published account went so far as to say that the party was full of fascists, criminals and scum, and another piece showed a prominent party member bragging about setting fire to migrant centres. He was subsequently arrested. I should maybe add at this point that the person that set fire to the hotel that cost Sherman her leg, he still wanders free, as he was never found. Thing is, the party still managed to get three members in the parliament. Nothing groundbreaking, but it was a big issue about the time, so being in fact that the future Prime Minister, Wim Kok, dubbed the elections a black day in Dutch history, which characterised the way the political class perceived this apparent insurgency. Nothing symbolises this more than the treatment of Will Sherman, who took one of the parliamentary seats. Her designated office was situated on an upper floor, only the building had no lift. How could this have been anything but intentional? Sherman was left with the indignity of having to have a security guard physically carry her to and from her office every day. To dig the heel in further, Sherman reported that many politicians sniggered at her discomfort and even laughed when she obtained a prosthesis. This dehumanisation of the Centre Democrats spread further than Sherman's treatment by her political colleagues though. The party, despite having up to 3,000 members, had barely a hundred activists that were prepared to leaflet and spread the word. It's not so hard to see why. Sherman had lost a leg, many had lost jobs, friends, loved ones, social stigma is real and this not only provides a strong incentive to keep Stumm, but also selects against moderates from joining the party and campaigning on its behalf. Most people simply had too much to lose. Indeed, perhaps the reason Jan Maat stayed in the business of politics until his death in 2002 is that he had nothing left to lose. One member related. Over time, one gets used to the estrangement from family members. In the beginning, it really hurts, but right now I say they are grown-ups, it's the way it is. But my brother and two sisters have made that choice. I don't see them anymore. An Indonesian guy who is born and grown up here with whom I have been on vacation several times felt that he couldn't be friends anymore. I had quite a few friends from the business club who, because of their business, couldn't talk to me anymore. In private, in a bar or a restaurant, yes, but not in public. The slew of councillors the party were able to gain throughout the early 90s, mostly defected, were absent or veritably incapable. In short, thanks to the repressive atmosphere, the party found it nigh on impossible to attract any moderate members, capable of lifting the party from the dirt. And also, we have the problem of Jan Mat himself. Jan Mat ran the party like a family business, only trusting his wife, Sherman, and her son with the day-to-day. -day. 
up-and-coming politicians were treated with suspicion. Not too surprising, considering the numerous infiltrations that had occurred in the run-up to the 94 elections. It seemed also that in many ways, Jan Mat favoured the politically illiterate, as they were less likely to compete for leadership. To illustrate just how low the bar was, one journalist in 94, posing as a homeless man outside of Jan Mat's office, requested party membership but claimed he couldn't scrape the funds. The supposed vagabond was swiftly given an office job in order to pay for membership. Regardless, Jan Mat's stubbornness and ill judgment hardly was as deadly to the party as the militant tolerance of the Dutch state and civil society, and in many ways, the latter contributed to the former. The 98 elections saw the Centre Democrats lose all of its parliamentary seats, and the party died a death. Jan Mat did attempt to resurrect his political career in the form of the Conservative Democrats, but they never competed. Jan Mat died at the premature age of 67 in 2002. He's survived by his wife. The story of the centre parties is more of a tragedy than anything else. However, unfortunately, the political violence they suffered wasn't to dissuade further acts of violence in the future. This brings me to my next video. The rise and fall of Pim Fortine List, or rather, the life and death of its founder. Pim for time. Thanks a lot for watching the video. If you liked the video, don't forget to click like and please do subscribe if you haven't already. If you didn't, click dislike, leave a comment, tell me where I went wrong. As always, a huge thank you to all of my patrons. It's thanks to you guys that these videos are regular. If it's within your means to do so and you like what I do, then please do consider supporting the channel yourself. As always, thanks again for watching and until next time.